All right, so what better to talk about than right after lunch than a, a data structure? Um, <laughs> that's basically what I'm here to talk about. I think it's a really cool data structure. Um, the company was founded on this data structure, but we're going to talk some theory. We're going to learn about bee trees and how a fractal tree is different. And then we're going to jump into practice, which is where I live. Um, I'm a benchmarker at heart. I like talking about benchmarking. I'll try to explain my results. But before we dig in, um, a little bit here. So who am I? Um, in the immortal words of Kurt Monash, who's a local database or data analyst, Mark Callahan's lesser known but nonetheless smart brother. I have, uh, I briefed him once. He came to that conclusion in under 20 minutes. I have an agreement from my wife that that's going on my, my tombstone. So, uh, but it's my goal in life to prove Kurt wrong someday. And I've got the URL there in case anyone who wants to go there and, uh, and comment on that, that blog is still live so you can keep going. But if you came here to see Mark, I apologize. He's about 5,300 miles away in Buenos Aires having a, doing a talk today. So this will not be about my sequel at Facebook. Um, my agenda is this. We're going to do bee trees versus fractal trees, a little shootout, a little data structures, 50,000 feet. It's going to be a little hand wavy. I apologize, but we don't have that much time. And then I'm going to show you what, uh, what a different or better data structure can do in, in products, in product form. So TokuDB is uh, a MySQL implementation of fractal tree indexes. TokuMX is, uh, we've implemented it in MongoDB about 15 months ago. Again, there, 20 minutes isn't a lot of time, so let's dig in and look at the, uh, the data structure itself. Before we talk about bee trees, just some quick vocabulary. Um, I think there's a lot of computer scientists in the room, so this should just be review, but in case uh, you're, you're not, um, this is what a bee tree looks like, a very simple fan out of two. We've got pointers and pivots on this slide. So the goal here is to get to data quickly, to find things with uh, relatively little effort. And the way we do that is in these uh, upper um, boxes here, we have things we call pivots. They help us decide what path to take, to go right or left. And then we have pointers to take us down the tree um, to find the data we're looking for. Um, every bee tree has a rule. My rule is greater than or equal to. So we're going to go right on the tree when we're greater than or equal to what we're looking for. Uh, otherwise, we go left. Um, the other vocab that's important here is most B tree implementations uh, do this uh, as well. So we've got internal nodes, um, and they're the, the top level nodes in a tree, and then leaf nodes at the bottom. The internal nodes are there for pathing. They help you get to data quickly. Um, the leaf nodes, if you're uh, data or database people, that's, um, that's where we're going to store the actual data. So in my example, we're just going to use simple numbers as keys, but these are key value pairs. So your actual data, if you're doing MySQL, it's a row. If you're doing MongoDB, it's a it's a document in a collection. And you store these sorted uh, in the bottom for fast access. A quick example of how you'd search in a bee tree. If this was my bee tree that I'd set up and I wanted to find the number 25, I would start in the root node, which has a 22 for a pivot. 25 is greater than 22, so I go right. It's less than 99. I go left. And then I search in the leaf node for what I'm looking for. Um, it's sorted, so there are algorithms to get there quickly. So indeed, uh, by doing a few tests and compares, I can find that the value 25 is in this B tree. Um, another B tree primitive is, is inserting data. So if I want to insert the, the, uh, the key value pair that's the key of 15, I'm going to find the leaf node it belongs in. So I'm going to go to the left of 22, to the right of 10. I end up in that leaf node, um, and I store 15 between 10 and 20 for easy lookup. Um, there's a big downside to bee trees. They were uh, created a long time ago, um, certainly in, in, a, in, a, in a time when uh, data was different. You know, we're all here talking about big data, about analytics, about fast. So when a bee tree fits in main memory, uh, it's very quick, very, very efficient. Uh, when it doesn't, uh, problems can occur. So you're going to be I.O. limited when your data is bigger than RAM. Um, and, and an important thing to note there is the cost of, uh, of I.O. So in this example, if I wanted to find anything greater than or equal to 22 in this example, if this was the state of my uh, system, that 22, 25, and, tw and 99 are, um, are on flash or on disk. And you could argue that flash is extremely fast. So Tim, the cost of I.O. Is, is near zero. It's expensive to buy Fusion I.O., but it works very quickly. Why should I care? Um, it's not just the execution time of getting data from that device. It's also about your cache. So you're going to be evicting data to bring new data in. The cache uh, is thrashing and, and performance is, imp is uh, impacted. So you're now all bee tree experts. Um, I'm going to make you fractal tree experts in the next four slides as well. Something uh, 
I put this slide together recently for this talk to, to really drive the point home. Um, and this isn't even drawn to scale. Most B-Tree implementations, uh, for example, InnoDB and MySQL uses 16K uh, nodes, these, these uh, boxes here. Uh, MongoDB uses 16K nodes. You can go smaller. People argue on Flash you might want to go eight or four for, uh, for smaller um, reads off the devices. Fractal tree nodes are huge compared to that. And it's part of, uh, the reason for that is part of the way the data structure works. So here's a picture of a fractal tree. Looks a lot like a B tree. The similarities there, we're gonna store data down in the bottom in the leaf nodes. We're gonna use index keys for ordering, for pivots, for pointers. It's identical to a B tree in that way. It then gets very different. The two differences are one, uh, the nodes are big. By default, uh, a fractal tree node is four megabytes. It's entirely user definable. There's use cases where somewhat bigger or smaller might make sense. Um, but we do a lot with those, those big uh, nodes. Uh, one thing we do there is, is something called a message buffer. So if you look on the picture there, the, uh, the internal nodes of that tree, they've got these message buffers bolted onto the right. So to store pivots and pointers, it's maybe a kilobyte of space is required. The rest of the four megs in those upper levels is for message buffers. So all internal nodes have these message buffers. These buffers fill up. I wish I had an animation for this, but I don't. But as these buffers fill up, they cascade down the tree. So on a, on a brand new fractal tree, we put a whole bunch of messages in the root node. Eventually it overflows. It cascades to level two. Eventually it overflows again and cascades. When these messages flush all the way to the bottom to the leaf nodes, they get applied. So a perfectly flat fractal tree with nothing in the message buffers is really a lot like a B tree. Um, the benefit of this flushing uh, technology is really about I.O. and amortizing it. So on that B-tree example, when we wanted to insert a value, um, we had to do, uh, likely we had to do an I.O. to get it off disk if we're, if we're dealing with big data. But we also, at some point, we dirtied some data. It's in our cache. We have to write it out. And uh, that could scatter writes all over the disk. In a fractal tree example here, um, it's, a, it's a much simpler data structure to describe an insert operation. This is an insert. We just drop a message up in the root node and we move on. No I.O. was required uh, to get that done. Search becomes a little more complex because if we want to find 25 now, not only do we have to go down the tree, go to the right of 22, to the left of 99, we find the value 25, but along the way we had to visit these message buffers. And the reason being, the, the insert for 25 might have made it all the way down the, to the leaf node, but after that we might have done what you see here. Uh, there's an increment operation, so increment 25 we're bumping a value up by four. There could be hundreds of these messages above. So what a fractal tree does on, a, on this find operation is it collapses all the messages on top of each other and ends up materializing a row to the end user. Um, messages are, are pretty much limited only by uh, either my imagination for giving work to engineers or the engineer's ability to get the work done, right? You could do almost anything with a message. You, we focus on the most interesting things. So, so here you can see in the very top uh, leaf node here, we have a message called add column. And if I'll show a, a benchmark on that in a minute. If you're a MySQL person, um, you'd notice that, wow, we can add a column to a table in MySQL with TokuDB with nothing more than a simple message injection. One operation, we're fully available uh, with no downtime. Increment operators, delete operators, update, um, you name it, um, pretty much anything can become a message in the tree. Uh, the message buffers are, uh, are just buffers for operations. So we've productized this uh, over the years. The fractal tree was invented in, uh, and uh, discovered and created in, in around 2005, 2006. We spent uh, between 2009 and 2013 uh, implementing it in MySQL as a storage engine. Um, we call that product TokoDB. Um, it's got some pretty significant benefits over stock MySQL. And, and here we're gonna talk about InnoDB, not, not my ISAM. So the, the, the benefits are our performance um, for greater than memory uh, workloads. Uh, InnoDB is fantastic as an in-memory data store. Um, really high compression, and um, if you've ever tried to do compression in MySQL with Inno, it comes at a great cost. Facebook has done a lot of work um, patching it and making it work really well for their workload, but um, it doesn't tend to be general purpose. Agility, we'll talk about online schema changes. From a technology perspective, MySQL has always had a storage engine API, so we've implemented under that, that engine, but we've also done uh, a significant amount of patching to take advantage of our functionality. I always bring this up before I ever show a benchmark. I'm a benchmarker. <laughs> I don't apologize for that. I love benchmarking. I hate the reputation benchmarkers get. 
Um, I, I now know how lawyers feel when you meet someone, you, they tell you they're a lawyer and you wonder you know, what kind of person they are deep down inside. But um, <laughs> Greg, Greg Ron's someone I follow on, on Twitter. I'm not really sure why I started following him, but one day he tweeted this and I've, I've kept it. Um, and there's, there's other, other ones you can find. You know, many benchmarks are like magic tricks. When you know how the results are achieved, you're no longer impressed. I'm trying to, to uh, make that go away, so I'm happy to answer questions either in the 20 minutes or afterwards to talk about what I've done here. Um, there's been a spout of other benchmark complaints recently. My, a tweet I, I put out into the world was, don't trust a benchmark you don't understand or you didn't write yourself or you know, open the source code. Um, but they're not magic, they're not hard to understand. So in MySQL, we, we started out, um, the fractal tree was, was born to do this exact benchmark. So this is the perfect use case, the perfect storm for TofuDB. This is indexed insertion. So I have a single table, I'm inserting into it, it's got an auto-incrementing primary key and three secondary indexes that have a random insertion pattern. So for some of you, that probably makes perfect sense. For others, I'm happy to, uh, to explain in more detail later. If you look at the benchmark, um, TokuDB is in the blue line and higher is better on this benchmark. So TokuDB um, early on is about 35,000 inserts per second and when it levels off, um, it ends up at about 30,000 uh, inserts per second and it will do that for as long as you have disk space to be storing this data. It's not going to slow down over time. The red line's in ODB, and what you can see there is just a common uh, fact about how a B tree works. So in a, in a standard B tree, in ODB for example, while the data's in memory, in ODB is uh, phenomenally faster than TokuDB. It started out at 90,000 inserts per second, 80,000 inserts per second. That's really where in ODB has focused their time and energy. On, uh, on workloads that fit in main memory, and then they're trying, they continually try to get better at out of memory workloads. But you can see, as soon as the server didn't have enough cache to store those secondary indexes, that every single insert had three indexes to update, and every single one of those in, in, uh, index updates required I.O. So you could do the math. I think the storage system I was on here had 2,000 IOPS. Um, I was getting about 650 inserts per second at the tail. So this is doing uh, about a billion rows of, uh, of inserts. Um, another really nice feature in TokuDB is immediate schema changes. I was spoiled early on in my career. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that you know, products like Oracle, um, if you add a column to a table, it's instantaneous. It doesn't rewrite the table and block operations or they, you don't come up with these uh, mechanisms to try to do it um, in an online fashion. So, very simple statement here. I took TokuDB, I took InnoDB. This is running on a system with SSDs. And I started a workload using Sysbench at uh, 50 transactions a second. And 10 minutes into the benchmark, I said, all right, add a column to, uh, to one of my benchmark tables. And you can see in the TokuDB line, the green line there, it just keeps right on going. Um, because in the background, it was, it was actually as simple as dropping a tiny little insert mes uh, message into the buffer to say, uh, add a column to this table. And then from that point forward, if you did a select, it would materialize that message on top of any row you get back and, uh, and show you that indeed this, uh, this uh, column, actually this is a, uh, an expansion. So I'm taking a, a small var chart and making it larger. So th this would happen immediately and online. Um, InnoDB gives you two options. It's nice to have options. Um, neither of them in my mind are favorable. So one option is block. So InnoDB at the 10 minute mark goes down for about six minutes. Um, during which it's rewriting the table in its entirely, entirety, uh, rewriting the primary key, rewriting the secondary indexes. And when it finishes, InnoDB gets right back to work here. Um, the other option is to, to do things in the background, to do this on your slave, to try to operationally make your life more complex. So I think this is a great example of, um, of what this messaging architecture of fractal trees uh, can enable in products. TokuMX um, is a little different story. So we had about five years experience um, creating a product under MySQL. MongoDB was out. Um, it was doing, uh, you know, lots of people use it. I met with people at lunch and I think one or two people at the table were using MongoDB. It's got a lot of developer attention. Um, MongoDB's, you know, our benefits are performance compression and uh, as I say, they're transactions and yes transactions. So if there's any database people in the world whose companies have adopted Mongo and you want to be able to do uh, first class multi-statement transactions in a Mongo product, by all means talk to me after, I'm happy to, uh, to explain what we did and how. But Mongo's always been focusing on usability, um, ease of use, ease of deployment. And they really haven't focused on perf performance and they certainly haven't uh, focused on compression. But the story of the product is we, we built a prototype. So we took the Mongo source code and we implemented a fractal tree as a secondary index just to see what we could do. 
ran some benchmarks, got some really favorable results, and then decided, okay, what are we gonna do here? MongoDB doesn't have a storage engine API. Um, there's one coming, uh, probably late this year, early next year, but this was early uh, 2013. So we did what any uh, sane company would do, we forked. We took a, a copy of Mongo, we removed all storage from the product, um, replaced it with nothing but asserts, and started the server, and watched the server fall over immediately, and then one by one, we replaced every single uh, call to the file system with a fractal tree. So if you know Mongo, there's an op log, that's a fractal tree. If there's a collection, fractal tree, secondary indexes, fractal trees, nothing but fractal trees inside uh, Toku MX. Um, the other thing we're able to do there by not, uh, given that we're not um, bound by a storage engine, is we're able to make optimizations that storage engines wouldn't necessarily provide. So in the MySQL space, everyone has to play by that storage engine API and therefore there's some features you can't necessarily implement um, that you otherwise could. And since we were forking here, we decided why not just go in and, and do whatever we want uh, to some of the upper levels of the product. So an interesting feature, we actually just implemented this two months ago, is what we call a fast update. I think it might be uh, more uh, appropriate to call it a blind update. And this is the ability of a fractal tree yet again to do a, a message injection. So if you're a Mongo user, you look at that statement to the upper right hand corner. We're gonna do, uh, on the foo collection, we're gonna update where ID five, and we're gonna increment a counter by one. Standard Mongo, standard Toku MX without this optimization, it's read, modify, write behavior. So if I'm gonna run this statement, I'm gonna dip into the foo collection, get the document where ID is five, pull out counter, get its current value, increment it by one, and then go right back in and, uh, and replace. Uh, with Toku MX in this optimization, we can ingest uh, this kind of increment operation at wire speed. We're not, uh, we're not bound by I.O. And there's, there's a really important reason for that. We're changing behavior. So if as a, as a developer you don't care about the after value of this counter, and lots of use cases don't, if I'm counting web hits or something for analytics, we can just ingest these as quickly as we want. We don't care what the value of, of this counter is until much later, maybe an hour later you run a query on this document and there might be 10,000 of these update operations that are stacked up on top of it. Or they might have flushed in the background and, and kind of cleaned themselves up. But in, a, in any event, if you look at the optimization, uh, same thing, I think I have a, a disk uh, system here capable of about 2,000 IOPS. So I can do 2,000 of these updates per second. I turn on the optimization and we're up to almost 40,000 of these updates per second. Um, one more benchmark I wanna show on, on Toku MX um, is, is uh, really the three sides of, of what fractal trees are doing for this workload. So this II bench benchmark, we also, it exists for MongoDB as well. So single collection, three secondary indexes. For this one to be more like a, a, a normal Mongo use case, we added an additional compressible character field. II bench is just a bunch of uh, random uh, ints and big ints. Um, as I say here, insertion's only part of this performance story. Compression matters, size on disk. Um, you know, we were hearing about cold storage. Certainly, I, I would assume most of what lands on that storage is gonna be compressed. Um, and then IO utilization, because um, good IO is, is not free. So the Mongo story is different. NODB is really focused on performance. Mongo never did. So if you look at this benchmark here, same, same collapse. Mongo started out decently performing, but then you can see it just tailed right off. Um, and this is only with 37 million documents inserted. The Toku MX uh, performance graph there levels off at about 8,000. Um, it's a much lower number than the other II bench benchmark because of this extra character field. So documents are a kilobyte larger. That needs to be logged. Um, there's a lot more I.O. going on for, uh, for logging. But the two parts of the story that are different here that are worth noting is, is the other aspects of, uh, of your workload. So what a fractal tree is really good at is compression. And in this example here, you can see this kind of step function as Mongo it's growing the, uh, its file two gigs at a time um, very, very consistently with respect to how big the documents are. Um, Toku MX um, is highly compressing. I think the factor, it was a factor of 12 on this workload. And the main reason we can compress that well is we've got large blocks. These four megabyte blocks get lots and lots of uh, similar data within them. And uh, you know, modern compressors have no problem making that small. Um, the last thing that I'm, I'm always interested in as a benchmarker, I try to measure all aspects of a workload is this. So not only is Tokomex going uh, significantly faster on inserts, not only is it si significantly smaller, um, it's doing all that on an I.O. budget that's about 30%. So you can see here, you know, when Mongo was tapping out at the end of the workload there, it's almost 100% I.O. utilized on the server, where Tokomex is hovering at, uh, at just over 30. 
Um, I think I'm out of time, so I don't have time for questions. My contact info is up there. I love talking benchmarks or talking our technology if you're local. Um, just give us a holler. Um, you can go to the website as well and uh, be happy to talk to you about fractal trees.